Good evening, and welcome to Vanguard Conversations with Women of Color in STEM, or Vanguard STEM, as, um, as those of you on social media know us to know us to. Vanguard STEM is a live monthly hangout where we pr promote a conversation and build community with emerging and established women of color in STEM. I'm your host, Dr. Jedida Eisler, and I'm an astrophysicist by training. I'm a, Na a National Science Foundation Astronomy and Astrophysics Postdoctoral Fellow at Vanderbilt University, where I study hyperactive, supermassive black holes called blazar. blazar. I will repeatedly remind you that you are more than welcome to join me in this research. It's one of the main goals, the goals of Vanguard, after all. Um, I'm also the founder and host of this show, Vanguard STEM, and I'm, and I'm excited about the conversations that we're having, uh, all of the really amazing topics and discussions, discussions that we have. So thank you for joining us, joining us tonight. A really important and informative show for you tonight. One of my favorites. I know I say it almost every time, but I'm serious. And seriously, we just we just get out. Um, our, our guest is Dr. Shine Chang, a cancer epidemiologist who are all Vanguard Center and Project Manager Tasha Berryman. Put, put us on. So thank you, Natasha. And we're so excited to have you here, Shine. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, we're going to talk tonight. The theme of the night is burnout, bravery, and being a woman of concept. And if you, if you follow us all this, you know that this came up in response to the story of Nyla Kidd. Um, she was a, a young African -American, American woman, student from Columbia and Columbia, and, and Chen, who had uh, um, sort of uh, an overwhelming experience, experience of leaving for a little, little bit and re-emerging to the sort of tune of the story that's a lot like burnout. Uh, and a lot of our community, community our Vanguard Stand community, city really resonated with that story and, and, and felt felt strongly about the about the notion of burnout and have felt it before. And so we felt that that was something something for for us to discuss. We're not, we're not so much that Nyla's person's personal experience because we have respect in the privacy of family and her and her. We are going to use it as a launching point to really try to understand and more of how burnout works. Um, how and how it, how it impacts us, impacts us as women of STEM. So, so but into that, we've got a couple of awesome things to tell you. The first, the first is that this is our one year anniversary of Vanguard STEM. Oh, we started this last, this last July. Wow, happy anniversary! That's a great milestone to celebrate. Thank you, and you're our first three guests. And this guest is amazing. We're really excited about it. And we, it's just been an amazing thing. Year, so thanks for being our anniversary guest. Anniversary guest, I saved that. Guest. <laughs> um, um, it's our season finale. We finished this two full seasons, ten whole episodes, episodes counting. Tape. So kudos to y'all for watching. If you've missed any of this, any of those episodes, you definitely go go to our website vanguardstem.com, where you can see all episodes. Um, and we'd love to have your comments and feedback and feedback about them and what we should do in the future. So season so season starts in August. Yes, so go break for the weary. Um, and looking forward to a, a new slate of topics and ideas, and we can't wait for, for you. So if you're interested in um, being on the show or contribu contributing to A, then reach out. Let us know. Hello at VanguardSTEM.com. We're also, also doing the Vanguard Guard STEM, STEM letter. Uh, this is this is our way of speaking directly, directly back to our sisters in the struggle, to other women of color and, um, in STEM who feel burnout or are feeling like they need some encouragement. So if you have, have a story of burnout or, or you have um, the idea that you want to share with your, your colleagues, please do send them to us at social at vanguardstem.com.com or to where we get on Facebook, Facebook and, and we are ready to um, share those share those kind of going forward. All right. Woo, a lot. Oh my goodness. Yes, we started. Uh, so before we jump into the, sh the show, I'm really excited about, I want to give you a couple of ways to participate, to participate because as you know, this is a live show. Live show. Really glad to hear. Hi to everyone, to everyone that's joined us. And so we, so we want to tell you how you can participate. So the first way, first way if you have a, a question, comment, something Shine says, says is amazing and it gets to you, uh, uh, call out, speak back to us. And I'm telling you, I, I talked to him this weekend and she blew, blew me away. She wasn't even trying. She, she didn't know that, but she was trying and blew me away. So she'll have lots of really awesome, amazing stuff to say. So if, if, it, if, it, if it's you speak to us, if you have questions, questions, so you can do that through Twitter. You can do that, do that through the Q&A box in the Google Hangout window. Or you can do feedback. We've got people on feedback. That's not actually a thing. I mean, on Facebook. Yeah, that's what I meant. 
<laughs> you can do it on do it on Facebook. We've got people watching the conversation over there. Uh, so those are the main main ways you can participate going forward. We are always welcoming you to face to face book on our group Vanguard STEM uh, group slash Facebook Vanguard STEM. Um, also on our on our website and through Instagram and all of the social media platforms. So feel free to join us there. All right, all the housekeeping is out of the way. So without further further ado, please let me be formally introduce you to our awesome, incredible panelist for tonight, Dr. Shine Shine. Dr. Chang received, received her undergraduate bachelor's degree in biology from Brown University and her doctor, doctorate in epidemiology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She's, she's currently the director of the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center's Cancer Prevention Research Training Program and a University of Texas, Texas English teaching professor in the Department of Epidemiology. In addition to four NIH HR training and educational awards as PI, Dr. Chang also serves as on advisory committees committees for other NIR 25 training awards, as well as, as well as a T32 training programs, which I which I know the sort of biology don't know what all of those words mean. <laughs> so she worked um, as she served as the associate director for the Cancer Prevention Fellowship, a four four year doctoral training program program. Oh, lost my thought. There it is. In cancer prevention research at the Nash National Cancer Institute, and she teaches annually for the AMC's Women in Medicine program, an intensive career development workshop for, for early women faculty faculty in medical to U.S. and Canada. Her efforts aim to prevent prevent chronic disease and improve health science. As such, her research in cancer epidemiology focuses on obesity, and obesity, and her research health science workforce reports and mentorship, diversity, diversity, and leadership. Welcome, Dr. Chang. Thank you so much for having me. We are so blessed to be here. I I a little bit about your history and pedigree, but can you tell us a little bit, a little bit more about the kind of scientific research that you do, that you do? Sure. So I am a cancer prevention scientist. I am trained formally in epidemiology, so very interested in what causes um, disease and uh, you know how to intervene on that to actually lower the risk of disease for individuals. Um, but my work um, as an epidemiologist has evolved, and uh, as you mentioned, I'm a training program director, and so. I have developed a lot of interest in how to train people better. A lot of it was originally motivated by selfish reasons. I needed training, so I asked for training, and I um, got other people involved in the training that I was doing. And I, over time, decided that actually training would be a lot better if people had the tools up front rather than having to figure it out on their own, what I call trial um, career by process of elimination, which I think is slow and inefficient and wouldn't it be a lot better if I and other people shared our stories and our experiences so that you wouldn't have to suffer those same problems you could just you know get on you know to whatever it is that you're supposed to do faster and easier and just you know be fabulous sooner so that has been my motivation for doing research in educational scholarship, in mentoring, in leadership, in women faculty and diversity. So that's those are those are the research things that I'm interested in. The epidemiology has been all about obesity and cancer risk, and uh, bringing together both epidemiological population based tools and biological samples and genetics to really try to understand what are the underlying reasons for weight gain and how that influences risk of cancer. So lots of things. <laughs> Very cool. And in fact, this sense of lots of things is really, really important community, right? Because right, because many of uh, uh, our audience members are, are people who have to do more than one thing, right? They're drawn more than one thing, whether it's, you know, whatever their research question is, but all this, but also some often very sort of sort of like health related or um, um, outreach or engaged things. So the fact that, that we see you, you success, successfully create a career that does us both really inspiring. Do you have, have any piece of advice for a, a young person, particularly one of color that want, wants to do both things, like do several things like you've done? Sure. Well, it's, um, you have to be organized. 
and you have to, you know, sometimes be pretty persuasive about the kinds of things that you want to do and how you're going to combine them. Um, you know, people who are trained traditionally, for example, like my department chair, um, she didn't know how to mentor somebody like myself who was developing interests in areas that she wasn't familiar with. And she didn't know exactly how to incorporate my interests in the direction of the department where she was trying to lead the rest of the faculty. And so there were times when I really had to, you know, pay attention to what she was telling me as a mentor because, you know, when your department chair says things like, I don't know how to mentor you and I don't know how to create a space in the department for you, you have to pay attention to that because, you know, you need to have people to be able to support you and to help you through and get promoted so that you can be successful. So you, on the one hand, have to kind of pay attention to what those criteria and what those needs are, but at the same time, can you do what you want to do and find fulfilling in a way that sort of accommodates both sides? You might not be able to do everything at 100 or 150 percent all the time, but maybe you could be, you know, sort of checking off all the boxes for your chair on the major things and then you know, spend a little time doing some of the other things that you're interested in and then go back and forth and back and forth again. So until you start to, to you know, really get some credibility and some traction in each of the areas, the, the areas where you are rewarded by your institution and by sort of the more traditional conventional ways of being, um, you know, until you have traction there, then perhaps you have to kind of downplay a little bit some of the other stuff that you're doing until you get traction there as well and people start to come around and say oh yes we really value both of these activities we see how they are beneficial to you to the institution to others and we're proud of this we want to embrace that that's when you really can start to negotiate for more you know sort of leverage or rather space to do the kinds of things that you want. Once start people in positions of authority and sort of credibility start to understand, you know, what it is that you're trying to do and that they value it and then can be champions for you, that's when you really can kind of go forward with all of that. But at the beginning it's a little bit hard because it's just, you have to spend a lot of time really convincing others why these activities are valuable to you as a professional but also to the greater audience as well so but hang in there you know it it can happen if you're convinced then just work on convincing others that is really good and good and and i really appreciate you saying that there are other things uh, that you mentioned you mentioned I want to circle back and under and underscore but first we're, ha we're having a little bit of technical difficulties so could you and do me a huge favor, favor? And when I can, could you mute, you mute your phone? Yes. We can cut down on the feed on the feed some of our viewers are getting. So so apologies for the technical difficulties. We'll get it fixed in a second. So I'm I'm gonna rely on my audience. audience to tell me if that helps helps with the back. Uh, but uh, but I wanted to while waiting for feedback. Tell you that it, that it, what you said. I really I really want to underscore this notion that you know number one you can't have everything all at once, which is absolutely one hundred percent true. True. Also, as you do do it and you do a job and and it, it you want people to form, formulate a language around it, then so yeah, you do start to pick up champion and uh, that will advocate advocate for you. So it's really good. That's really good. Really good. Um, so thank you so much for that. We did have a question about that might come in, so let me go to go to it first. Um, and it's from Stephanie Page. Stephanie Page. Uh, and, uh, and the question is: Can women and people people from the group are told to wait until they're they're fully established, which off, which often like till you're tenured? Um, before doing quote other other things, What's your response and advice for that. Okay, so my response is that that is often kind of old school thinking, and I think that if you are clever and strategic, then perhaps you can actually do more now than having to wait. You know, what is it, 10, 15 years until you're in a positional. Um, you know, have positional authority to kind of do what you want. I feel that uh, people at all levels, you know, from, you know, when they're students all the way up the trajectory, they have other kinds of power that may not be as obvious to people. So if you have a lot of um, 
sort of thoughtful ways of getting people uh, together to work together, um, perhaps to form committees and to uh, represent the committees, that's actually quite a lot of power. And you don't have to be a tenured full professor to do that kind of thing. Um, you know, leadership at all levels wants to know what people think. And when people are organized and, you know, want to enter into respectful negotiations, um, you know, the more people you represent uh, and the more sort of open you are to representing people in a fair way, in a way that leadership feels like they can safely engage in, that's a lot of power. Um, I think people in positions of authority, especially senior ranking people, um, often feel like, you know, nobody else should have power. And so by repeating these kinds of messages like, oh, you have to wait, or, you know, you know, that's a way of perhaps not allowing others to have so much power. At the same time, you know, the person sharing this information may have your best interest at heart and really are saying, don't be distracted by these other things that could either jeopardize your promotion or your career trajectory. You know, wait until you are world famous in this other area and can be protected by your scientific reputation before you engage in these things that are perhaps a little bit more risky. But, you know, I think as an individual, only you can decide that because can you afford to put off these social justice issues that may be really important to you for 10 or 15 years? I could not. And so at every level, when I was a graduate student, uh, you know, I was part of our epidemiology student organization and we did a lot of organizing and negotiating with our faculty. As a postdoc, I was also very active at my institution to try to represent the experience of lots of postdocs and started to no negotiate and request additional training that I thought would be useful to more than myself, but myself included. And so it was through those kinds of interactions and actually by doing a really good job, I was actually tapped by the institution to program institution-wide uh, early career sort of professional development activities. And I, you know, for a while I was dodging these calls from the vice president for faculty development because I thought he was calling the wrong person. And his boss ran into me one day. She was the, the provost of our institution. She ran into me one day and she said, are you gonna answer his telephone calls? And I said, I thought he was calling the wrong person. And she said, no, we want you to do this programming for the whole institution because we saw what you were doing for the division. We wanted to go out to everybody so more people can benefit. So I thought about it a little bit and I said, well, you know, when I finally did answer his telephone call, I said, okay, I will do it on a few conditions. Number one, it has to be recorded. So they have to be videotapes, has to be high quality. Uh, medical graphics has to be paid to make these beautiful posters because I don't want anybody to think this is some kind of, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, Xeroxing my own things and, you know, sticking it up with blue sticky, you know, gum wad, whatever that is stuff is, you know, it has to be high quality stuff. We have to have free lunches. It has to be evaluated. And he said, okay. And then I thought, oh, I should have asked for more. <laughs> and so ever since then, I have always asked for more, but I always ask in a way that shows that I'm very respectful of what the goal is and that the shared goal is a high quality product. So I won't engage unless people are on board about those um, objectives, those shared objectives, because I, I want the quality to be there and for people to really recognize that and appreciate that. That is really good, good, good. I like this, this you know, because part of it is be, being, being will take up the space and he's an um, so I love this idea of learning from you, you and learning to do how, how you've done it. Thank you so much for that particular, particular advice. I, 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 read, I wrote down that, you know, that it had to be the high quality, that you did medical, uh, professional grade graphics, right? Because you, you didn't want to look basically bootleg, bootleg but that's um, a, um, a really important bit in, ter in terms of producing excellence, not only for, for yourself, for your program, but also for those that are to be um, taking that information in uh, a quality matter. So thank, thank you so much um, for, for, for speaking to, to that. 
So we we have some more, some more coming in, which we'll get. <laughs> okay, so we have questions coming in in about um, burnout, which which we'll get to in just a second. I wanted to spend I wanted to spend a few minutes on our STEM and society section to talk about respite. Uh, dominated the news, the news recently, right? Uh, for those those of you who, you who don't know about it, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna judge, maybe a little bit a little bit of judgment. If Brexit, is, no judgment, no judgment free zone, not judging. Um, but Brexit is basically basically recent decision by vote votes to Britain, the UK, UK to leave the European Union. Uh, it's corrected basically for Britain, Britain exit exit. Um, um, and the vote of the country was. 52% leave the EU, 48% stay. It, it's had had you no know, overwhelming uh, percussions already, and and all the not even fallen. So we're still trying to figure it out. Uh, so it's a big, big, big political conversation. But but the way that it faces what we do is in terms of the science output in the book in the sense production. Right now, the UK, uh, sorry, right now, the EU, EU, the biggest producer of scientific output uh, uh, in the world, right? They're, they're at 22%. Um, and, then, and the nearest trees are China at 19.1%, and the US at 16.7%. So the EU, right now, the European Union produces an, an extensive scientific output, output. But with the UK leave, leaving the EU, um, that's going to really big impact in, in on their research production. So first, I just wanted to get us a sense of thoughts about uh, record in general, if you like, if you like but pretty as they relate, relate to the civic endeavor. And all, um, specifically, the fact that the vote in the general populace was 52 to 48 percent, with majority going to leave. But it, but in the scientific um, nature, nature did a poll of 2% scientists, and it was and it was wildly different. It was, it was an 82 percent stay. 12% leave um, um, vote. So, do you have any sense of, sense of you know, uh, thoughts on why those two um, votes were or all, or all the vote, but those those two uh, populations had such such different opinions? Well, I don't know if you've looked around, but scientists are different kinds of people. <laughs> I think. Uh, you know, on Myers Briggs personality inventories, all those kinds of personality inventories, scientists tend to score a little bit differently. We are just wired differently. We value different things. Um, so I think that it's not not actually that surprising that scientists um, come out differently on you know whether or not Britain should leave the EU. That said, um, I think that science nowadays, we really are coming into or are in a golden period, at least in the bio biomedical sciences. You know, we, the technology has advanced so fast and there's so many things to discover and things to learn and new tools to use. And, and um, I'm not just talking about the tools that we use in our labs. I'm talking about the tools that connect us as individuals. So you can, I mean, here we are, we're on Google Hangouts, right? And we're talking, you and I are talking, but we're connecting with so many people all across the globe. I mean, I don't know if we have people outside the United States, but we, we could. And so this kind of being able to connect in real time or asynchronously with people all over the planet is just unprecedented. And so I think for science, because we know and are beginning to value more and more that really good science, new discoveries, new inspirations come out of connections and teamwork and team science, that that really is why we are different and why we may be voting in a different way. Now that said, the whole Brexit thing, you know, there's so many details to be worked out and so many unknown things at this time. But I think that, you know, on the one hand, it could have a dampening effect on how science moves forward in the UK for some time. But I actually have great hope, especially among the younger scientists, because younger scientists are typically less afraid to try new things, you know, use new tools. I think they're gonna actually find different ways to interact and not let these barriers that maybe some of the oldsters think are gonna be a problem. I think the younger people are gonna just say, ah, whatever, I'll just go on Google Hangouts and we're gonna do our science that way or something. I think they are gonna figure out other ways of being. 
if you know there may be some challenges to the trying to get together in person what with all you know visas and you know the cost or what you know can i come work for you oh but now i have to get a work permit or a um, educational permit or whatever all of that is going to be very tiresome and hopefully you know more informed minds will prevail and they'll figure something out but i think for people who love science and want to you know participate i think you know that is really going to you know take precedent i don't think the people who are really passionate about it are going to let that interfere they will find a way so i have hope yeah that's a really, really fair point and in fact that one of the things one of the one of the critiques about it was that that as long as the freedom to, to move, move up uh wasn't wasn't too, too adversely adversely impacted it would it, it would probably uh, okay, might be, might be an overview, but it, it would be less, less impactful to the actual scientific enterprise. Now, there are global, you know, you know I shouldn't say global, they're global. There are um, EU, EU-wide locations to that, to that right? So the amount of funding that they was getting versus how much they were putting into EU um, isn't exactly, exactly yeah, they were putting in less and they were getting out. So, you know, there are, I think, large, larger issues, but I think you're, I think you're, you know, some people generally really lead the, lead the charge on, on ingenuity, innovation. Um, um, there hasn't been a sort of, well, a, a systemic impact won't over, over, over data of the, of the ingenuity and the intuitiveness of young people. So absolutely, 100% on that. Uh, so thank you spending some time with me talking about Brexit and, and its impact on them. You make very reasonable good points about that. But without further ado, it's now time, time to get into meat of our conversation. We want to talk about bur burnout. We want to bravery. And we talk one about those two things in the context, context of being a woman of color. Woman of color. So talk to me a little, little bit about how you first got inter interested in this the sub subject of burnout and resilience as a research area. Um, um, yeah, t why, don't you, why don't you start that story? Okay, so um, I there's a few reasons why I'm interested in burnout. First of all, as a faculty person who mentors trainees and uh, you know teaches and has other responsibilities, um, you know I'm always adding more to my plate. In fact, we joke about how we don't really have plates anymore. We have platters, big platters. And um, you know, for somebody like me who's interested in so many different things, I have a tendency to say yes to a lot of stuff. And so my friends and I, we are, you know, we talk about how much work it is to do what we do. And of course, you know, that leads to other kinds of conversations. And uh, you know, part of the reason why I'm particularly interested in burnout is that not just from my uh, experience as a faculty person, but also because when I was in graduate school, I had a very classic, severe episode of burnout myself. Um, I had been working on, uh, you know, I had done the, the oral defense of my dissertation proposal and was working on three assigned questions to get back to my committee. And right while I was working on that, I was, you know, struggling a little bit with it. And right in the middle of that, a friend of mine died unexpectedly and it sent me into a tailspin. And so, you know, I wasn't, um, you know, I was struggling with the work and at the same time I was really upset about my friend and I didn't know how to manage all of that. And so I would clean my apartment and I would sit at my desk and I would read articles to try to help me and, you know, with my research and I would read like a sentence over and over again and like I couldn't understand it because I was I was just really in a bad bad place. Fortunately, at UNC Chapel Hill, they had a very talented and supportive, uh, you know, psychological counseling services for students there. And I walked in one day and I said, I I think I need help. I'm struggling with my dissertation, and I see you have a dissertation support group. And um, the guy I met with, he said, Well, the group is actually ongoing and it's full up right now, which kind of tells you something. <laughs> but um, he said, I'm happy to work with you directly until space opens up and you know, then you can join the group. And so he was able to coach me through that experience. And, you know, within, oh, I would say 
you know, I mean, it did take some time, but you know, within a short period of time, I was able to get right back on track and, you know, it was fine. And I graduated and I went on to a postdoc and a faculty position. And so, you know, that was a lot in my past. But then when I was an associate professor, um, I started to have those feelings like, hmm, something's going on. I probably should check in with somebody. And I went to the faculty academic programs um, uh, service and I was talking to somebody and he um, had me do a time management inventory. And so I, you know, for a week I recorded everything that I did and I came back and I handed him all my documents and he says, okay, I have a few questions for you. And he said, okay, do you work from priorities? And I said, yes, I do. And then he said, and do you um, uh, schedule time to do your work? And I said, yes, I do. And he said, okay, um, well, I have some good news and I have some bad news. And I said, well, what's the good news? And he said, the good news is you're really successful. I said, okay, well, thank you. That's nice of you to say, but I need some help here. I feel like I'm going to slide back into burnout here. And he says, the bad news is I don't really have anything to share with you because no matter what I tell you, you're not going to do it. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? And he says, well, my the solution is actually for you to stop doing so much work. You know, you're working, you know, of course, you're 40 hours during the day, but then you take home work at night and you're working on the weekends. You need to stop. You need to stop and do other things so that you can replenish yourself. And I said, but, I, you know, is that allowed? <laughs> can I really do that? And he said, well, yeah. And I said, but why, why do you think that I wouldn't do that? And he said, because the formula to your success has been over time to work more and more and more. And so if I were just to blithely say, well, stop, you'd think I was out of your, out of my mind and that I was incredible as a psychologist to help you and you wouldn't do it because, you know, that's part of the formula to your success and potentially that can be very threatening to you. And I said, oh, I see. And he said, and then I said, well, you have to give me something because I, I know I'm headed for burnout if I don't do something. And he said, well, you could try taking one night off. And I said, oh, well, that's so scary. And I said, okay, I think we're done for today. But I, I, I listened to him. And then the next week I scheduled one night off. So after seven o'clock, closed everything down and I stopped working. And you know what? It was fine. So one day grew into more days. Now after Friday afternoon, I don't pick up my BlackBerry until Sunday. And I only do that to kind of get myself organized for the next week and to plot out what I need to do and when. So, you know, it can be done, but you have to kind of, you know, watch for the warning signs and be careful about how much you sign yourself up for. Um, you know, my, I, so I, as you mentioned, I teach for the AAMC, the uh, group on women in medicine and this um, workshop that I give this two hour workshop on burnout and building resilience. Um, it, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. And I'm always thinking about more stuff that I want to include in it because I think that the people that I teach really need, they deserve some really useful, helpful tools. And so, you know, there's just not enough time for us to actually get into all of the details here. But, um, you know, burnout can be a very difficult and serious affliction. It's something that can be, um, you know, you can get out of it, you can recover from it. Uh, of course, if you've ever had it, you know, you never ever want to go there again. And people often, they have simplistic answers like, oh, just take time off. If you are seriously burned out, taking time off might help some pieces of it. But if you kind of have to come back into the situation where your burnout occurred, then a lot of that is going to come back and it's going to be as intensive or more so than when you left because you didn't really get at the root of what needs to happen. So when I went through that burnout episode in graduate school, the psychologist had to work with me on sleep hygiene, on physical activity, on uh, diet, um, you know, a bunch of things. He taught me progressive relaxation techniques. 
He talked to me a lot about, you know, how is organizing my time and priorities and things like that. So there was a lot involved in how to recover from that. And so some people will need the support and guidance of somebody who's trained in how to do that. And fortunately, like I said, at UNC Chapel Hill, they did have those services and really talented people who knew how to do that. Um, I don't know if all campuses have that. I would hope that they would um, because I think this is unfortunately probably more common than not. And nowadays, what we're seeing in the work that I do with faculty is that, you know, there's, and actually Tate Schenefeld, who is an expert on burnout among physicians, he's done really elegant work, work to show that the rate of burnout among physicians has actually increased over time. And so, you know, many people are on faculty and there's emerging evidence to suggest that, you know, these are serious problems at that level as well. So, you know, it's a big topic. Fortunately, um, you know, Christine Maslach, who is a, um, I think she's a counseling psychologist who's on faculty at UC Berkeley. I think she has recently been the vice provost for undergraduate education. She is a leader in the field and has written several really important books about burnout, about professional burnout, and what causes it, and you know what strategies uh, exist for institutions. So there, there is information out there. There are uh, good resources, um, but I think the best thing to do is to really never burn out if you can help it. Um, and yeah. I think you wanted to ask me um, in our previous discussion about this session. You wanted to ask me to define burnout a little bit. Exactly. So, there are burnout is characterized by three um, three sort of uh, constructs. The first one is emotional burnout. The second one is called depersonalization or cynicism. Uh, we think of it as social exhaustion when you're not able to deal with people in a courteous way. You start to treat them like objects. And then the third one is having a low sense of personal accomplishment. When you have uh, bad scores in all three areas, then you are on your way to burning out, if not already there. Um, so these are the three sort of um, characteristics of burnout. And there are, Maslach has designed what is considered the, um, the gold standard tool for diagnosing burnout. And so her full inventory is 22 questions that, you know, when you take the, answer the 22, you can score it, and then see how you score in each of these three dimensions, and um, you know you have a sense of it. The good news is, of course, that burnout is, a, is not a trait. It's not something that is about you. It's just how you are at a particular time and place. So how you score today may be very different from how you score in three months, hopefully you know, better in the future, of course. Thank you so much, much for that. Exactly the kind of kind of informational information and stuff, stuff that I was excited. Thank you for saying that. Uh, uh, to review uh, the uh, the emotion depersonalization and low soul accomplishment as the three three areas of burn. Of burn. Um, we will also also have a list of some of these resources on our website at following the following the show. Uh, Shine has agreed to, to to talk about that to make sure to make sure we get some of these like um, resources resource that you have at your disposal too to, to read and understand more about them. Shine, I have some more of our questions coming in. The first is an, an exited affirma affirmation that Kat is still at UNC, and one of our just recently recently in the PhD, Dr. Page, is say, saying that that's the one of the best one of the best resources. So I'm sure you're gonna know that that is at least still in process. process. Um, then there was a question about, and you sort of spoke to it just a ago. But it was about burnout that results result by desire to oneself. This one comes from Geraldine Cox. Hey, Geraldine. Um, especially in new and environment. Um, and so she says, she says that she thinks this results in her accomplishing a lot, a lot, as you said, but that's how you become to become civil. Uh, but, uh, but she wonders if it will be enough, enough. And to have any advice for dealing with, dealing with those feelings. You spoke a little to, a little to about this here, um, but I wonder, wonder if addressing that question and also, you know, getting a little bit to that point about how how you address this kind of thing when, when it is completely related to your, related to your success. 
And since viewer, viewers are still having a hard time, do you mind kind of recapping the question so that they know what your answer answering? Okay, well, hopefully I caught all that. I think the question is about um, dealing with burnout when you're coming into a new position. Is that right? Yes, yes, exactly. You feel like you have to prove yourself in a new space, so you end, end up doing a whole lot, but, but when is enough? And how do, how do you avoid burnout? Right. So, actually, I'm really interested in this because I think that more and more people are not sure about how much is enough because, you know, a lot of people who are, especially people entering into academic positions, they are often, and if you're at a research one institution, you are often, you know, entering a environment that is filled with people working at capacity. And so there's this sense like, I have to prove myself, I have to prove my worth, I have to be as accomplished or more accomplished than all these other people. So, um, well, so, you know, first of all, I think that um, this problem is growing because I'm just looking at some of the responses for my next batch of assistant professors from medical schools. And I can't tell you how many more people are asking, how much is enough? How many hours in a day am I supposed to work? How much work should I take home on the weekend and at night to work? You know, because I'm not allowed to do it during the day because I have clinical responsibilities or whatever it is. So I think that is a sign that the whole environment is actually changing and that in past, I think normal people would say like, well, you kind of do your 40 to 50 and, you know, you maybe you do things occasionally on weekends, but only the things that, you know, you have an urgent deadline or something like that. So I think there you, people used to have a fairly healthy sense of what was enough to be promoted. I think now people are starting to feel the pressures from their institutions about funding and about, you know, um, about visible success. And even the people who are mentoring the younger junior people are not so sure themselves. So first of all, you know, the first message is I think that the environment is changing a little bit. So you're not alone in having these kinds of feelings. Of course, a lot of this has always been there. You know, the idea you're coming into a new place and there may be the people who are there already and they're maybe feeling a little threatened by the newcomer, the, oh, you know, you you interviewed so well and everybody's all excited about you coming and, gee, I might feel a little threatened by that because I do similar work or whatever. So then there's like, you know, competition with the, the people who are there and are they friendly, are they less friendly? So that kind of thing is always been kind of in the background. So I think first of all, my advice would be talk to the people who supervise you, right? So if you're in an academic department, make sure to talk to your department chair, have a direct relationship with your department chair because it's through that department chair that your promotion happens. So if the department chair is, is supporting you, is behind you, is knowledgeable of everything that you're doing, then they're gonna be able to help you better. So have them on your team and check in with them frequently enough so that they understand, you know, what is going on with you, whether the, you are signing up for too many things, they can counsel you on that. Use them as a resource to deflect some invitations to things that are maybe not the best for you to say, oh, I'm so flattered to be asked to serve on this, you know, holiday planning party committee. Um, let me get back with you. And then you go to your department chair and say, well, you know, this thing has come up. I'm not sure this is the best use of my time. Perhaps somebody else would be interested in that. I would be much more interested in this other committee to organize the, you know, um, uh, the promotions uh, education seminar that we're going to do. Okay. So, you know, go and talk to uh, your department chair. If you're being asked to do too many things that are really not appropriate, you can tell your chair, you know, I keep getting asked to serve on all these committees, but it's taking away the time that I need to actually work on my own research. And so I need you to help me kind of deflect some of these invitations because I don't want to be perceived as not a team player. I want to serve and I want to serve appropriately, but at the same time, I have to be careful about my own success 
success of my own productivity. I don't want to fail myself because I was in service of too many different, you know, interests. So um, there's that. One thing I did, which was kind of, I, I stumbled into it and I didn't even find out that I had done until years later, was that when I first moved to Houston and took my job as a postdoc here at MD Anderson, my office was, it was actually the copy room, <laughs> but it was the room that was the first room at, you had to walk by to get into the rest of the department. And so I didn't know anybody in Houston at the time. I was brand new to the city and they didn't really have anything else to do. So I would get up, and go to the office. And because at night I didn't have anybody to meet for dinner or anything, I would then just stay and work a little bit more. I was working on my dissertation papers. So, you know, I had stuff to do. So I was often like one of the earliest people to get to the office and one of the latest people to stay because most of the people in the department at least the faculty, they would leave by five. So I would stay till you know, 5 36, whatever. And later on, years later, somebody said, Oh my gosh, everybody talked about how hard you worked. And because I was always the first one that they passed in the morning and the last one they passed in the evening. But you know, oftentimes I was like out the door just minutes after they were, but they didn't know. And so like I kind of gave off this really hard-working impression at the very beginning, which I now tell other you know, trainees who are launching for my program, do that because you only have one opportunity to set a first impression. If you set a first impression that you are really hard worker and really committed and all that, then later on when you're sneaking off in the middle of the day to go have ice cream sodas with your friends, they won't know that they you know they just think you're going off to some meeting or something somewhere so you get away with a lot because they already think so well of you from the very beginning so that's my my dirty secret <laughs> cheers to the ice cream soda cheers to the that cheers to that oh thank you so much i want to i want to also again underscore for the, the fact that you are a master at using reading resources you if whether it's whether it's from actual creative resources and in the Developmental resource, or it's the human resource in terms in terms of talking to your talking to the people around you. I want to point out now that you're that you are pushing back again, um, stay, staying and, and how critical critical that is to success. So thank you for pointing that, that out. Um, had another question come in from Monica Mohair. Hey, um, she wants to know how you deal with how one deals with feeling feeling clearness and the burnout that come, that come dealing with that. And are there, are there ways to potentially use those feelings to your advantage? Well, I'm sorry. Can you repeat that last bit? The feelings of what? Feelings of burn, of burnout that come with feel an other. And then, and are there ways to use that to that to your advantage? Okay. So the feelings of burnout and feeling like other, uh, not the majority. And if you can use that to your advantage, well, definitely. So, you know, women of color, you know, it's hard to miss us because number one, we're women, people can typically often tell. And then if you're a woman of color, you know, people can kind of tell by looking at you, right? So often, you know, and other people have written about this, the double burden, right? The double tax that people, of, women of color often have. So one thing would be definitely to talk to your uh, department chair or, or whoever's supervising and just say like, look, I'm being tapped for too many things and you need to, you know, force other people to, you know, get on board. It doesn't always have to come from me. You know, so-and-so can talk about this. Other people can talk about it. Um, you know, it, it shouldn't always have to come from me. Now, with regard to the feelings of burnout, if you are feeling like you're on the edge or at least you're overwhelmed or overburdened with stuff, I would definitely be talking to people who supervise and support you because the last thing they want you to do is to burn out. You know, they have a lot invested in you, they recruited you, they are supporting you, they want you to be successful. So when things happen that are starting to make you feel like, oh, I can't do this so well anymore, I'm not bringing my A game to the office anymore, then you have to talk to people and say, you know what, I, I think I may be, you know, my, my plate overfloweth. And I need some help in really reprioritizing what I need to do and to be focused on so that I can be successful. 
So you may need to take a break from some things. You need to maybe stop certain other things. They may need to provide you with additional support. Maybe you're trying to do too much all by yourself. For a lot of um, for a lot of uh, people in the postdoc early faculty transition, they often are not mentored into learning how to delegate fast enough. And so they have this idea that they have to do everything themselves. They don't know how to ask a secretary to do something for them. They make it out to be a favor. Could you do something for me in your free time? Oh, don't worry, I'll just do it myself. You know, and really, no, we need you to do the things that only you can do. And we need you to get help to do all the other things or to let them go if that's what you know needs to happen to allow you to focus on what you need to do so you know if you are having these feelings go ahead and vocalize them to the people who support you so they can help you um recently i was talking to my secretary and telling her that i have recently you know i also am a special assistant to our interim chair for the department of epidemiology and recently there's been sort of a flurry of activities for the department that i've been drawn into and so it has put behind some of the other things that I'm involved with. So I was talking to my secretary and I said, we need to organize my day differently because it's filling up with too many requests and I don't have enough time to actually get my own work done. And so we organized a strategy where she is going in and blocking off times and not allowing other people to just free schedule themselves with me. And so she is on board with helping protect me and I've talked to some of my other team members to explain what the situation is. it doesn't mean that I will always be this way you know I will you know when things free up again then I'll be more available to others but during this short time when I have urgent deadlines myself I need some protection I need other people to help me and so I've asked people to take over different things to make sure that those things are covered and you know that's how it's going to have to be now of course if you're a grad student it feels weird because you're like well who do I delegate to so when I was in graduate school, um, I, we had a tight group of friends. And one of the things we figured out to do was what we called um, the onerous task trade. And what we did was we figured out everybody had like one or two things that like they just could not get to doing. So for some people, it was so for mine, I could not defrost my refrigerator. I had like this old timey refrigerator that had like two inches of ice caked around in, so I could not get my ice cream in anymore. So it's something had to be done. But I could not find the time or the effort to do it myself. And my friend, she was doing a study and she had to address um, something like 500 envelopes. And so we did a trade. So she came over to my house to defrost the refrigerator and I sat there and I helped her, you know, address all of those envelopes. This is I don't know why we had to do it by hand back then. I'm sure there was a computer program now, but you know, anyway, so we just spent a day of it and she got hers done, I got mine done, and it was like that. So sometimes what is onerous to you or difficult for you, somebody else can help you out too. So it's really just a matter of like coming up with creative strategies to get help. Um, one of the uh, suggestions that my mentor had for uh, other people who have small children is that when his children were small, he and his neighbors on his street, who also had small children about the same age, they created sort of a, a dinner co-op. And so every week, a different family would cook dinner, cook like three or four meals for everybody else in the co-op. So you had to spend your whole weekend cooking for like, I don't know, five or six families or something, and everybody had their own cooler. And so you would just fill up everybody's cooler, and then on a certain date and time, Everybody would come and retrieve their cooler, and then they had meals already cooked, you know, for three or four days of the week. And that was huge because it meant that they didn't have to do it. They just had to reheat and serve. And the reason why it was kids of the same age is because kids of the same age typically have the same kinds of food preferences. You know, everybody hates whatever's and everybody loves chicken fingers. And so that's kind of what you prepare for people. But you know, finding out clever ways to kind of do things together or get them done for yourself, you know, it's, it's not easy, but as you go along in your career, you'll find other ways to do it and more and more people to be able to help you. So good luck with that.
And I want to hear any good suggestions anybody else comes up with. Listen, Shine, I, I need mean, oh, that you gave me life with the onerous task trade. I'm about, about that life. I'm so about that life. life. So that was a fantastic idea. Yeah. Um, and I'm definitely, definitely looking for some takers. So, so Vanguard community. Hey. Hey guys. Um, um, really, really, you know, I, I love that idea. You know, that there are some things that we build mental blocks, and, and not every, not everyone is saying one. So, really, trade, trading to make sure that uh, uh, we the best solutions is fantastic, fantastic. Also, you know, your point about the use of secretaries. So it's true, graduate students, undergraduates, and um, don't generally have their own personal secretaries. But it is also true that there are secretaries that are sort of the administrative secretaries. For the department, who are often often there to help with basic administrative administrative tasks for every in the department, and so I and so I said even before we get our own, it is important to recognize that we can ask the secretary, secretary our administrative assistant in our, our department, if he or she can help help us with tasks. So really great point that that um, coming to become experts on on a particular area, it is it is not our job to basic. Um, sort of administrative tasks of, of of the work. So thank you for pointing that out. So, so, oh my goodness, it's almost the end of, end of our show, and there's so much more for us to, us to cover. Um, um, so let me just quickly into the bravery section of this conversation. And the research literature, literature, you've known that this is the resilient part of it. And so I'd, I'd like you to, you to talk a little bit about resilient, resilient, how more resilient, and how to one's own level of, of resilience to um, um, persist through burnout. And then I, I, I did want to speak more about how resilience doesn't necessarily always mean canoeing on the same path. path. There is freedom, and, and um, we all have the have the ability right, to change directions. That all things can be resilient. So, can you talk to us a little bit about what the research research said resilience, and also so about um, in making choices that allow us to con continue to be resilient. Okay. So resilience, as most people define it, is the capacity to bounce back from some kind of, uh, you know, assault. Okay. So um, there has been some research in this area, some very good research in this area, and a couple things um, are key to remember about resilience. One is that um, how you actually define your goals for things can help you achieve them better. Okay, so um, this is this is something that is um, kind of new to a lot of people. But there are there's language that's more kind of approach language, and then avoidance language. So avoidance language in a goal would be I'm not going to do something, right? An approach language would be I'm going to do more of something. And so let's say. Um, so in my situation, the example is uh, working with a trainee who is struggling with their writing, and maybe I'm asked to do more and more edits or you know look at more and more revisions, and so maybe I'm frustrated with that, and I say I'm not going to look at any more revisions. Right? There's only one way to be successful at that goal, which is to not do it, not do the one thing. But a, a better goal would be to say I'm going to increase my trainees engagement in the value of writing okay because there are multiple ways to be successful at that goal and one of the key points about resilience is actually brainstorming brainstorming multiple strategies for success so this is very very important because when you coach resilience with people you actually have to hold back on your telling them what to do you have to teach them how to brainstorm and let them learn how to do that and to grow that muscle stronger, right? Because three is better than one, six is better than three, 12 is better than six, right? So if you have 12 strategies for how to be successful, then if one doesn't go well, you go to the next one and you've already thought of it. Right? If you have to stop and brainstorm after every single episode, that's going to be a lot longer. So the idea is to teach people how to brainstorm, brainstorm fully, brainstorm a lot. Right? Even if um, you know, some of the ideas are really not as feasible, 
but just to go through the exercise of brainstorming as much as possible. One of the problems or things that people often do while they're brainstorming is to edit their brainstorm. And you don't want to do that. You want to brainstorm fully before you edit, right? Because if you start pruning the tree before you've let it grow full, you don't know where some of those other branches may have let, you know, gone to. And so you may not actually benefit from the full brainstorm. So you have to brainstorm a lot and you have to brainstorm fully. You have to use approach language so that your success, your chance of success is greater because you have so many more strategies to try out if any one fails. Okay. So um, that's a lot about um, resilience. What, I'm sorry, what was some of the other questions? That was fantastic. Fantastic. We'll go at we have, we have two coming in, in um, from Natasha. Thank you. Hey. Um, I wanted to go back to your notion of taking time off and then starting to build in some um, health behaviors. And so basically she wanted to know is, okay, we understand that taking that off is, is important, but how do you suggest one spend that time? Is it, is it good to have it completely just open or be structured? How do you use, once you say, okay, I'm going to take time off, how do you use that at time wisely? Okay, so uh, let me let me make sure to make a clear distinction. My point about taking time off when you're burned out was to just mean that just by taking time off without addressing the burnout will not actually make the burnout go away, not completely. So if you are if you are really burned out, then you may really have to get some counseling to get yourself fully out of it. Okay, so now that aside, when you are taking time off, you know, away from your work or away from whatever it is that you spend most of your time doing, you should be doing things that replenish you, right? Things that you love to do, things that make you joyful and happy. You know, that could be, you know, spiritual, you know, it could be connecting with people at your church. It could be connecting with your family. It could be meditating. It could be doing your artwork. It could be exercising. It could be a lot of different things, but it has to be something that really fills you up. Chores would not be among those lists, on the list for me at least. So when I have time off, I have to remember not to just go home and do house chores and things for other people just because I'm done with, you know, what I've done at work. I have to remember to fill my self with things that I love because only when I feel fulfilled and taken care of and inspired, then am I starting to recover from whatever it is that is, you know, draining me from my daily activity, right? And even when I'm at my best, I still have to replenish because you can't just keep taking from the well and expect everything to continue on and on. I have this uh, analogy that I tend to uh, use. I, For many years now, I've really disliked the term work-life balance because when I think of balance, I think of teetering on a tightrope where if you lose your step, woo, suddenly you're falling to your death, right? Because balance can only be achieved for a moment or two at a time. What I like to talk about is training like an athlete. And for me, I think of training like a track and field athlete, right? Because there are meets that you have to go to. And if you're part of a team that does like, you know, a decathlon or something, you have to learn a lot of different types of activities. So if you're in academia, you have to learn how to write papers. You have to learn how to write abstracts. You have to learn how to give presentations and write grants and teach and all these things, right? So the same in track and field, right? You have to learn the high jump. You have to learn the pole vault. You have to build stamina so you can run long distance. You have to learn how to jump over the hurdles because that's a, a you know, that's not a natural movement. Uh, well, maybe if you're a caveman or something, that's a natural movement. But anyways, so you have to have, you have to learn new things. You have to be coached, right? So somebody has to teach you how to lift your leg just like that. They have to watch you and say, no, no, when you're going over the, the bar, you are hooking your elbow and that's why you keep you know screwing that up. You have to do it like this. So somebody has to coach you and then you have to train and practice and increase your stamina. And once the meat comes, 
You can't just go into another one. You don't do marathon after marathon after marathon. You have to stop and recover, right? Even runners, you know, people who run on a regular basis, they know you cannot run seven days a week. You have to stop a couple days and do other things. You have to cross train and you have to let your body heal from some of the micro abrasions or micro injuries that you have when you're training for distance, right? So there's a lot of stuff involved. And so, you know, what, and everybody's sort of how you spend your time off, how you replenish yourself is going to be really different. But don't just go from the work at, at work to the work at home. You have to do things for yourself because if you can't take care of yourself, you're not going to be very useful to other people if you burn out. That is really good. Really good, really good. Training like an athlete. I love it, love it. I am copious notes. You are giving me life, life, and I get to be on call with you. And from the amount of conversation that's happening, happening on social media on the subject, I would I would say there's so much more that we have to ask you and so many more questions we have we have many people have felt like felt like really spoken their love language tonight tonight so thank you so much for all your insight and information and as we said we'll begin with you to share some more of the, more of the courses on burnout on on race um and and put you on the spot but i i'm pretty pretty sure that is would be really really happy happy if you come back and spend more time more time with us about this subject you don't have to answer now but we'll be we'll be talking to you <laughs> i would be happy to come back and speak again lovely thank you thank you so much let me ask you one more closing question because i think it's it's a way to start to push push towards that the, our viewers can do now that they've heard all heard all the amazing advice again we'll be talking more about this website we'll be writing writing about it we'll be with dr chang um but question is you know one of the key underlying features of a lot of these inter interventions is really community Right, right, and having people around, people around this question, Tasha. So, so how do you build build the community around you um, when you're in the middle of sort of sort of you're teetering on burnout, teetering on um, these kinds of uh, things? How do you build build in the middle, knowing uh, as we do that community and networks are important? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so. You know, so first of all, let me just say that I think that when we're sliding down into that hole of burnout, that and I, I like that analogy because it really feels like a hole. You know, you're going dark, you know, deeper and deeper into a dark place, and the sky, you know, at the top of the hole is sort of shrinking, and you you feel like there's less and less you know, access to the air and to the light and gee, you know, who, who can help me? I'm getting deeper and deeper into the hole. So I think first of all, you know, you go to the people who know, you know, have your back, you know, your family um, and the people who really love you and to say, I, I may be in trouble here. I need help. And, you know, to reach out to them and to, you know, and you may have to be vulnerable for a bit. But you know, if they love you, they're going to want to do everything that they can for you. Once you have a little bit more, you know, sort of, you know, that feeling of support around you that way, then you can, you know, figure out who else can I talk to? Who are my friends at work? Who are my friends in this arena that I can reach out to? Maybe it's not somebody at your own institution at first. Maybe it's your best friend who, from grad school who is now a postdoc or a junior faculty at another institution. Can you reach out to them and begin to talk about it a little bit more and then get some ideas about who else you can talk to? Ultimately, you want to be talking to the people who are supervising you because, you know, like I said, they have a lot invested in your success. So, the last thing they want is to find out late in the game that you are struggling and you know could be helped, but you haven't come forward yet. So let them be part of the team that helps you and gets you back on track to being successful again. Um, you know, when we're feeling more and more isolated, we lose creativity and we feel like there isn't anybody around who can help. And that's part of that kind of psychological um sort of path into burnout and it actually happens for other kinds of situations so like battered women 
often have that. You know, they, you know, people wonder like, well, why do you stay? It's because they feel like they can't leave, that they are in a hole that no one cares, that no one would help them anyways. And so, you know, they, they feel more and more confined and restricted. I also have a term that I call some of my trainees, I call them battered trainees. And it's a battered trainee syndrome where they, you know, are being abused by a bad faculty mentor. And, you know, this is what happens. And, you know, sometimes you can actually kind of see it. You know, you see them being less responsive. They don't come out so much anymore. They don't reach out. They're always in the lab or whatever it is. And you think like, what's going on with them? Why aren't they? And so, you know, when you see that happening to the people around you, you want to reach out and just say, you know, hey, you know, you don't seem like you, you're your normal self so much recently. Is stuff been going on? Do you want to talk about it? Here, let me buy you a cup of coffee. You know, so, you know, little things like that can actually make a huge difference when people start to pay attention and just reach out and just say, hey, you know, how are you doing? You look a little down. You want to, you know, you know, tell me about, you know, what's going on with you? What's going on with your family? You know, sometimes it doesn't take very much and then the floodgates open and, you know, suddenly then you have something that you have to deal with, but better that you catch it early, you know, before something really bad happens because the recovery, just like anything, if you can prevent it at an early stage, you're so much more ahead of the game, right? And that's, that's what I do. I do cancer prevention. <laughs> I'm a training program director. I want to prevent problems before they happen. Well, you have prevented so so much disillusionment in the call. I am am reading comments that um, our viewers are having, and, and they you have really blessed. So thank you so much. You so much. You probably sort of to tears on that uh, bad bad or tra trainees thing because it, because it uh, is something that something that happens. We at the level of, level of students at postdocs talk, talk amongst ourselves, but to hear so, hear someone like yourself talk about it and and and, and uh, the fact that that some of us are being are being in these situations um, and that, and that that is a real has real psychological, mental, social implications, physical implications. Is um, yeah, it brings, brings I, I am deeply appreciative, appreciative. So with that, let me just thank you, thank you. A hearty, hearty, hearty thanks on behalf of everyone, everyone watching tonight, everyone who will watch, watch this so, sub, subsequent. There's so much here. We will, we will definitely be coming back to talk with us more about burnout. So y'all watching, watching, get your question out there because we will do it, we'll do it again. I will be sharing resources on the on the website. So thank you, Dr. Jane, for being, for being a family, for being um, part of the team, Vanguard STEM. STEM. Uh, on our squad. Uh, just as a reminder, we'll be, be keeping up our Vanguard STEM, Vanguard STEM report. And I think with this com this conversation on Burn, you can see where it for us as a community, community and, and engaging one in another. Okay. If you feel so led, led, please write a letter of encouragement. Uh, volunteer to take an onerous task from one of your one of your Vanguard STEM squad members. Uh, see if you can build in this kind of community here. In this community, you can visit us on uh, on Twitter at that Vanguard STEM. You can see on Facebook in the group Vanguard organizations with Florida Florida STEM. Uh, we are. Uh, you, uh, you can write, you can email us. Email us at we need, uh, Please do reach out. out. Um, we are always accepting Women Crush Wednesday um, in STEM WCW in STEM nom nomination. My vote is for Dr. Chang Chang Chang. Um, and if you're interested in writing or writing on Vanguard STEM, please do email us, email us at hello at vanguardstem.com. Uh, this episode of Vanguard STEM would not have happened the kindness, generosity, and the end uh, of, of Vanguard STEM folks from the sharing, sharing to the retweeting, those are your live feed, live feed. Thank you so much. And it's a huge thank you to Dr. Shine Chang Chang. I seriously cannot thank you enough um, for, for taking the time to speak with us, to inform us, to validate and, and amplify the feelings that are giving us a language and a literature to build on and understand. Uh, so, so hearty thank you, thank you. You were here to give you a hug, so I'm giving you a virtual hug right now. Okay. See there, that was your, that was your hug. <laughs> um, all big thank you to the Vanguard Vanguard team, uh, to to Lana Hunt, who's our operations manager, manager, and her does a lot of our graphics. Uh, to the public public display section to come up with our new logo. More on more on that 
people to Natasha Berryman, project manager, and, and the awesome who brought us into Dr. Dr. Chang's orbit. So, so thank you so much to, to Christelle DeFrank, who's our social media coordinator, to Jasmine Johnson and Madison and Matt Molina, who are our writers and contributors on the on the website, and to Paul Rogers, who's our talent manager. That's our Vanguard STEM intern team uh, and our full team there. So, so thank you all for the work you do to do to make Vanguard what it is. Thank you again to our audience and community members. Y'all are the best. Um, and with oh, and, and thank you also to that Johnson who helps us with our video editing. Uh, so thank so thank you so much for that. You all, you all are serious. I can't even, even with people. It's so much goodness and this everywhere. Um, Dr. Chang, I'll give you, you uh, your sort of, sort of, if you had that you wanted to, that wanted to give you the opportunity to, to do that. Um, but before that, before that, let me just say that our next season does, does start. This will be August 2nd. It'll, it'll be our third season. It's jam packed with even more amazing. And clearly now an episode, episode another, another episode of burnout and dealing, dealing with that. So, um, um, I hope. Dr. Jadida Eisler and Dr. Dr. Chan, is there anything else, else you'd like to add as we close this episode? Well, just hang in there, everybody. It's hard to do, but you can do it. So just hang in there and keep plugging at it. Thank you so much. Again, I'm, I'm your host. This is Vanguard Sam. I'm Jadida Eisler. This is Dr. Shine Chan. Shine Chan. It's been our first to spend time with you. Have, have a good night and we'll see you next month.